Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever had health challenges that just won't go away, then do we have the Dirty Gene Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dr. Ben Lynch, naturopath extraordinaire, an expert in epigenetics, and the author of a phenomenal new book on flipping on the good stuff and flipping off the bad, Dirty Genes. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about a breakthrough program to treat the root cause of illness and optimize your health. That plus we'll talk about a tale of two mice, huskies and crew, subsistence living on Samosimo, becoming addicted to broccoli sprouts, Tasman and tyrosine, what on earth is a jackamaroo, and what in the world a Russian fur coat salad has to do with anything. Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Ben. Are you ready to shine? Man, I am. I'm excited. Let's do this. You got me all pumped up. Yeah. All right. So before we dive right into things, I was going to ask where you grow up, but we started talking off air, and I'm not sure I have this right. What was this? 12 dogs, how many horses, and what else? We had, grew up on a 100-acre horse ranch. We had 12 dogs at one time mm -hmm. and 44 horses, thoroughbreds, yeah. within their bonkers, crazy. And then we had 40, about 40 cats and they would those numbers would go up and down depending on coyotes, eagles and whatever they felt. And uh, we had a couple of pygmy goats and we, we eventually got turkeys, which scared the UPS man. <laughs> And uh, we had a stray cow every now and then that would come in and jump inside the pastures with the horses. So, yeah, it was definitely an interesting, fun spot. What, what animal, if you, can, if you can choose one, what animal or type of animal attracted you the most? Boy, you know, I'm, I don't tend to play favorites. I think each animal has its own unique characteristics. And depending on the moment, mm -hmm. that's what attracted me the most. I love them all, really, equally. Do you think it was growing up, and, and I'm picturing behind Mount Hood, I got to run, my wife and I got to run with a, uh, a wild herd of, of Mustangs and, mm. and, until they kind of turned and drew a line in the stand, one of the stallions, and said, no further. But, but I'm picturing hanging out with a large number of stallions. Actually, that must have been extremely high strung, um, to say the least. But growing up in that atmosphere... Was that your first taste of, of understanding there had to be more of a natural way or a natural solution to things? I think so. You know, you, you see the natural order. You know, you see birth, you see death, you see, um, you know, nature all around you. Because while I grew up on a 100-acre horse ranch, which was very spacious indeed, you know, you, you also have the vastness of mountains and buttes and lakes around us. I mean, our nearest neighbor was a mile away. And, uh, you know, it was exceptional. I was always climbing uh, the mountains around our home and go trail riding for hours after school. And, and uh, I would just go. And so I, I think I, that connection with me, you know, I don't know if I resonated because I lived there or if that was just the type of person I was and I was thriving there. And however it came to be, um, it was awesome, you know, seeing uh, horses delivered and foals being delivered and puppies and kittens and, and, uh, you know, seeing them sick. And we had this huge stallion. He was about 17, two hands horse racer out of Kentucky, big, beautiful gray. And, uh, his name was Bowie Asia and he got trapped under the fence one day and he, he was just thrashing about and he came and he, he, well, we walked up to him and he stopped. Mm -hmm. He just completely stopped. He absolutely knew we were there to uh, help him and get him underneath uh, out of the fence and he was as calm as collected as can be it was amazing this huge animal scared and then he saw two people coming and he just calmed right down it was amazing wow and i i like to say you are your land and you're a walking talking expression of your land mm. yes yeah and i think that is something that people need to really really resonate with and tune into because if, if you're living in in a country and you're not shining or you're living in New York City and you're not shining well where is that place for you and I've actually recommended patients before to move and to find this place and and for me I am a country guy through and through and I happen to find a little oasis in Seattle that feels like I'm living in the country and I'm thriving there yeah and Right now, we're in a rental home in the middle of a suburb, and I'm not really thriving here, 
but I'm, it's worth the wait because we're remodeling the home and I'll be out and I'll be back. So, you know, it's, I think that's a really important point you brought up. Do the kids get to play outside? It's a different generation now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, Dr. Dad is, is, uh, gets pretty on him about video games and all that. So in Seattle, I mean, we have cloudy gray skies. So in the, those times, days and years and well months, um, they can play video games and so on. But when summer comes, uh, video games and TVs are, are gone and they're outside. And uh, we're very fortunate to live on a lake and uh, right near a mountain. And, and uh, you know, our neighbor is really cool. We don't have a fence. So our yard is twice as wide as others. So we're, we're always outside in the summer. Always. Awesome. Woohoo! Yeah. So if I understand this right, you went from the ranch, you ended up traveling around the world, at least 40 different countries. You ended up living. I've never even heard them this heard of this before. Samo Samo? Somo Somo, yes. Yeah, outside of Fiji. So, I mean, it's it's in the archipelago of Fiji. And so there's, I don't know how many islands Fiji has, but so we're on one of the mainlands in Fiji and VT, Vitu Levu, I think it's called. Um, but we landed in Nandi. And I learned from a for, uh, friend of mine that uh, if you go to the fishing village mm -hmm. or the fishing market, fish market, where the fishermen are selling fish, I forget the name of the town, but you go there and you, you offer gifts and the gifts are flour, sugar, and, um, cassava, um, and kava root. Mm -hmm. And so we did those things and we asked, uh, the first fisherman we even asked and said, you know, we'd love to go and, and live with you and your Island and help out and check it out. And, and he was like, sure. And his English was very, very broken, but we gave him the gifts and, Six hours, uh, we got on this little tiny boat, and the captain was smoking a cigarette right next to the diesel gas tanks. And diesel's not explosive, but it's still concerning. Yeah. And uh, we made it, and it was it was an exceptional experience. Yeah. Wow. How long did you live there? A week. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, it was the first. It was the first country for the entire year that I had visited, and that was probably one of the best weeks out of the entire trip. It was. Really, really amazing. I, I learned so much in that week. Connected to the earth. What, what, what? If you could could mention one lesson, what would it be? Simplicity is amazing. Uh, you know, richness comes in all facets and forms. Uh, you know, we're here in America where richness is is goods and commercial products. And what do you have there? It's it's connecting with your community, your family. There is no borders there. Everything was just community garden, and it would tend to one part of the garden that was their assigned little area to maintain, but they would just harvest other people's stuff as they needed, and they would do trading, and, and they had no electricity. They had no running water. Um, they cooked everything with fire. They slept on the, on the dirt, um, grass huts. So I would say simplicity would be one, but happiness comes in all f facets and forms and I mean they're running barefoot and, and and they had no shoes it was just it was awesome it was really really cool near and dear to my heart <laughs> yes yeah I mean they're so exceptionally grounded and, and they they wanted to have a, a celebration on our last evening there and <laughs> and uh I could have stayed longer I could have stayed longer and and uh so they were gonna have a chicken dinner and there's chickens and dogs and cats were just running all over the island and and it wasn't a big island but a gorgeous one and so said, yeah, okay, let's have a chicken dinner. So this kid, he was probably eight or nine years old. He picked up a stick, probably a foot long. A chicken was just cruising, just running through the village. He picked it up, he threw it, hit the chicken right in the head, and bam, knocked it, gone. Just killed instantly. And it was, I was so impressed. And these kids are climbing like 60, 70 feet up in these palm trees, coconut trees, grabbing coconuts, yep. like nothing. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. So yeah. fast forwarding from there, what's a jackamaroo? <laughs> jackaroo. Jack yeah, so a jackamaroo. I like the sound of that. But a <laughs> jackaroo, a jackaroo is a cowboy. Yeah. So it's basically there's a jackaroo and there's jillaroo. So cowboys and cowgirls. So I grew up on a horse ranch, right, in in Oregon, and I I had a huge goal to work on a cattle station in the central of Australia in the outback, and I don't know where I learned about this, but I. I did. And 
I found, finally got a job, and that's a whole story in of itself, how I got the job. And it was no pay, um, but I'd be get room and board. And uh, two weeks after being there, working, I was there for a month, uh, I was full pay, top tier, and uh, made good money for that. But it, the Jackaroo is basically a cowboy. I was one of seven people on a one and a half million acre ranch in the middle of nowhere, literally the middle of nowhere. And the land was so flat that we had this ginormous tower mm -hmm. that uh, you could probably see from many, many points in the, in the area on the property. And we, had, we would always have to radio in because um, people would get lost and, and die out there. You know? So um, that was before cell phones. Wow. And then yeah. fast forwarding from there, one, one more adventure. You volunteered with Mother Teresa. Mm. Yeah, so that was another goal of mine was to was to work with the sisters of, of uh, and um, you know so I when I was got to Calcutta and Calcutta was the last leg of my year long trip and I left I arrived Fiji at two hundred and thirteen pounds four percent body fat mm -hmm. as a husky fit rower and uh, you know just finished my junior year in college to arriving in Calcutta from an overnight. 44 hour train ride or so from Jaipur, India to Calcutta, getting out of that train, going up the steps and seeing absolute chaos in the streets where there's lanes in the road, but the Indians, they don't care. I mean, these Indians are just driving everywhere and there's just black pollution everywhere. And I was 165 pounds at this time and my hair was down to my shoulders. And uh, so I stayed at the Good Samaritan there and, um, which is basically a hostel that's super cheap. And I learned that I, Mother Teresa uh, was accepting volunteers just at this place uh, not too far called the Prem Don. And so I walked with the volunteers one morning and showed up and, and they said, yeah, you're welcome to help out. And I walked into this building, which was solid concrete. And imagine a Home Depot or a Costco empty. Okay, empty. So you walk in and it was cots lined up uh, one after another with super skinny people. I mean, I was 165 pounds. These people looked, um, you know, very, very, very poor. Uh, and they had uh, buckets of feces next to them, and their feet were uh, crawling with maggots, and they had blankets, and they're all curled up. So they, it was, it was an op eye-opening experience. And so they, they get up and. They go to bathe, and my job was to clean up all the poo and, and uh, pee and wash the sheets. And um, so, and then I, yeah, it was, I could go on and on, but that was an amazing experience. And then having um, Mother Teresa give me a, a card and shake my hand um, was a powerful experience. And she passed away only a couple months after I had met her. So she was working right up until she passed on. What did you learn about compassion from that? Well, it was, it was a very unique experience. I mean, the, the compassion was definitely there because she served her entire life with, for these folks and they were living on train tracks. I mean, when you leave the Prem Don, you walk over this bridge where there's probably four or five train tracks and people are living in plastic bag homes or cardboard boxes, literally. And, but there's still, where they're still completely bathed and wearing button-down shirts and their hair is perfectly combed. They're brushing their teeth. They're clean. Their, their posture was amazing. Um, so even though they're basically homeless, they, they were very proud and, and, and happy. You know, these are the folks outside. And for the Mother Teresa and the compassion of the sisters, um, I don't really know how much I learned about that. I learned more about the victims than I did of the sisters themselves. There were moments that were really concerning me, frankly, Michael, where um, when I was helping, uh, working with a guy with uh, a big, huge, swollen foot and maggots, I mean, I could literally see all the tendons and ligaments exposed in his foot. And um, we laid him down on this concrete table and put a stick in his mouth, and I had to hold him down while he was screaming in pain. And and pulling these things out of his legs, a nurse was, and that was hard for me. Um, that was really hard. In fact, that was probably one of was my last day was I got kicked out because I got scabies by giving a homeless person uh, a few dollars to buy infant formula for his kid. 
which led me basically homeless uh, because I had no more money. I had to uh, share a taxi with an Israeli to get to the airport. And uh, I came home with 80 cents in three different currencies in my pocket. That's how busted I was. And, wow. <laughs> yeah. So let's fast forward from there. Let's, let's start diving into Dirty Jeans and talk about a PBS special, A Tale of Two Mice. Yes. So here I am back in civilization. And uh, many years later, after I was introduced to amazing Ayurvedic medicine in, in Jaipur, India, which led my way to starting studying more about health, which was amazing. And actually, so you I, had gotten quite sick, hadn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in Jaipur, I was very ill. And uh, I was exploding from, from both ends. And I was very, very bad. I mean, I was profusely sweating. I could not even really stand up or walk. Um, I was very, I know now that I was electrolyte deficient. When I was in Calcutta, um, even after that, I, I, I could feel that I was not right. And I was walking back and I had my hand on the building to my left and my vision was gone. It just left. And I, I continued walking with my hand on the building, and then I just fell over. And uh, thankfully, the East Indians around me were really cool, and they helped me out. And uh, I came to, and I got my vision back, but it was really scary. But in Jaipur, yeah, I got sick and went to an Ayurvedic practitioner there, and I didn't know who he was or what he was or what they were practicing. It seemed really weird to me. Um, but I took their herbs and their medicines, and within about 30 minutes or so, I felt about 80% better. And I was drinking who knows what. It was herbs, and one of them looked, smelled like cow poo, um, and maybe it even was. I still have some of those after, and I'm, I'm going to put in a beautiful little uh, shrine of mine in my office and set them up because that that was my whole introduction to this whole field of medicine. And um, that did lead me eventually to Bastyr University, which led me to the Tale of Two Mice. And I was as I was watching the video of Tale of Two Mice, it basically this researcher who who had the genius of this study, took these genetically identical mice, mm -hmm. they were babies, and they she gave them uh, just standard rat chow, yeah. and then she gave another group, the same litter, um, the standard rat chow with nutrients. And they went on through life, and these mice were genetically predisposed to cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, okay. right? They, they were genetically set up for failure, right? because they wanted to study them. That's what they were designed to, to do. So the researchers could make interventions, right, to see if these things would uh, heal themselves or get worse. So they would, they were mice specific for research. And so she just gave some nutrients and they never went on to get these conditions. I, I literally put my hands on the table, Michael, and I, I, I slammed my desk down and I pushed my chair back. I forgot I was on wheels. I slammed to the other side of the, uh, <laughs> the wall behind me and I, I looked at the computer and I said, that's what I want to do. And it was so amazing to me because as I, as I was at the very end of the um, presentation, I, my mouth was just wide open. She goes, well, now that we, you know, we've got this tremendous amount of information, but it'll be years and years before we know what to do with it. I was like, are you kidding me? You just did it. You just did it. We don't need to wait. You, you did it. So I, I felt that as like, you just told me what I needed to do. I needed to take people who are genetically predisposed to major conditions, which happen every day, so everyone, and we need to support them with nutrition. That's it. Woohoo! Yeah, right. And and so you you started diving into this, and so. yeah. did were the biggest changes first to yourself? That's a good question. Um, changes to myself you know I was already doing this for a long time I already knew about supplementation I already knew about diet um, I think it was the biggest awareness yeah. um, may have come to myself but I, I don't want to put words into my brain here but I, I would say that you know there was many many moments that I reflected upon back in my past where I was definitely sick and I could see that nutrition did play a major role. Um, I don't think it really hit me later though, Michael, until, um, uh, you know, I worked with a couple who tried having a baby and they, the baby basically died because they had no skull. Um, 
So that's not a good thing when you don't have a skull. It's basically a type of a neural tube defect, just very, very severe. And they had MT Jafar and so the sort of the baby. And they called me and they said, we would really like to try again, but we're really scared. And um, so I worked with them and they had a beautiful baby boy who was doing very well to this day. And I think that was the biggest moment for me where they were genetically predisposed. They had a previous failure, a very scary one. All I did was alter their diet. I gave additional supplementation, told them to do a few other things. And lo and behold, they had a beautiful kid and they had a second one as well. Woohoo! Yeah. What do you mean that every day our genes are writing a document about our health? Every day, our genes are, are doing something. Every single moment, right now, they're doing something. You know, they and they're doing something based upon what we're telling them to do. And so, it, I I like to equate it to we have 26 letters on our in our alphabet, right? And we can arrange those letters in multiple different ways. You want to write a horror story? You want to write a, a book on epigenetics? You want to write a cookbook? Do you want to write a, a story for kids? You know, you want to write a how to build a bridge? You know, you do that all with the same letters, which is amazing. And you just put them in different order. So we do the same thing with our inputs that we choose every single day where, you know, if you want to, you know, climb a mountain, you prepare a certain way and your genes turn on a certain way to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you are stuck in the middle of a tough situation, um, you're about to get robbed or you see someone coming from behind you, which is I happen to me in Fiji. And, um, you know, you have different genes turning on to get you out of that situation. And those genes got me the heck out of there real yeah. quick. Um, so, yeah, so that document is, is constantly being edited, revised, um, new words and new things being pasted in. And the cool thing is we're the author. See, I, I like that. When, when I started into your book, I admit to being a little bit nervous. And the reason that I was nervous is because everybody we know around us is getting genetic testing and then saying what they are. Mm. It defines them. And so I was nervous diving into your book until I got to where you're saying, wait, we can do something about it. There's a couple of types. Let's start with the types of dirty genes, but this is liberating what you've got in here. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that. You know, and you know, there's there's a few things and that happen along this whole journey, and and uh, you know the one. I'll I'll just say it. You know, my publisher wanted me to call the book Seven Deadly Genes, and I was like, no, I don't I don't really want to do that. I want to make it empowering and and uh, you know help people and, and not be s scared about it. And Seven Deadly Genes is you know there's some really deadly genes out there. The genes that I discuss in Dirty Genes are are very very amiable to our input. You know, we have, you know, your color, your hair color is dark brown, right? Mm -hmm. And so is mine, you know, and my air, my eye color is a certain way. And so is my skin color. I can't change those genes. That's how they're set. Yeah. So the, the genes and dirty genes are very, very flexible all throughout our life. And if we make certain changes, then we can clean these genes up. And if we clean them up, then just like those mice, we can really reduce our risk of various conditions and just even not even conditions. You can even the moment you say you get a runny nose or, um, you know, a slight headache, you're like, Oh, I got this, you know, DAO's genes dirty. Cause you learned that from the book and you take steps to get rid of it naturally, easily, quickly. And then, you know, you're, instead of thinking, Oh, I have a headache. I need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You think, Oh, I have a headache because this gene is dirty. So it creates a whole nother outlook for people to understand that symptoms are not there to get you. you know, you're not getting conditions because your body wants you sick. You have symptoms and conditions because your genes are dirty and they're trying to serve you, but you're not serving them. So start serving them so they can serve you. So is it, and I went through the questionnaires in here, is it, is it with the checkboxes, is it going there or where do you go when you, until you speak the language of dirty genes, how do you know when something's going on? How do you, I, I, I teach people to drop in and listen to their bodies. This is going to a whole nother level because that, that I don't have that subset of information. Now I do. Um, <laughs> how do we start to learn what gene is dirty? What do we do about it? Well, you read, you read dirty genes. And <laughs> yeah, it, so as you're reading dirty genes, you are discovering how you work. 
down to the genetic level and you're learning what a headache is a result of. And there's many different types of headaches. You know, not all headaches I discuss in Dirty Genes, but a number of them. Mm -hmm. And you're discussing, you're, you know, you're learning the mechanisms of how your body functions. And so if a gene, for example, let's talk, to, talk about one particular gene here. If one of your genes' job is to increase the dilation of your blood vessels, mm -hmm. i.e. allow more blood to flow, and your, your hands are cold, then that should tell you that your blood flow to your hands is reduced and that gene is not really working very well. So by simply changing your breathing through your nose, you're increasing nitric oxide production, which is what this gene makes, mm -hmm. and your hands warm up. And you literally can do that in about 30 seconds to a minute. And uh, that's real amazing change. And it's just tuning in. And like you said, tuning into me as I, I throw it throughout the book, I really want people to tune in. And that's a tough thing to do. And somebody asked me yesterday, well, how do you teach people to tune in when they've never tuned in before? I said, start with your breath because that's measurable. Beautiful. So let's, let's go from the breath. And we may double back because you, you just hit on one of my all-time most important themes in life. I'm trying to get everybody, everybody in the world to tune into the breath, drop into the breath, and breathe through their nose. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we can change that little bit, it changes everything because you're more present and yes. you're out of that fight or flight response. And I'm guessing you're expressing Dean's differently. Let, let's go to methylation for a minute here. Okay. Yeah. So methylation is a huge, hugely important process in the body. So a lot of people, to, to put it in context, people understand detoxification, mm -hmm. right? Detoxification is a process. It's a process in which, you know, chemicals come in, genes do their job, they neutralize these chemicals the best they can, and you pee, poop, sweat, breathe them out, okay? And so they're gone. That's detoxification. Methylation is one of these processes. It's a different one. And methylation has different jobs, a whole range of them, 200 plus others, uh, jobs that they do. And it happens heavily when you're uh, growing a baby inside of you, you know, with women. So their methylation is really cranking because what's happening is there's, there's new cells being uh, grown, developed, the baby's growing, placentas and organs are growing. So cell membrane formation is an act of methylation. Cell membranes are around every single one of your cells in your body. And if you're not methylating well, your cell membranes are not reproducing or, or growing and you're, you're going to struggle. Another one is if you're not methylating well, you're going to have higher amounts of histamine in your body. Mm -hmm. And histamine, you know that happens with seasonal allergies. And you take, if, you take, if you're a person taking Benadryl or antihistamines throughout your life or you have acid reflux or GERD or asthma or exercise-induced asthma um, or psoriasis or eczema, you've got high histamine and your methylation isn't working well. So that's a methylation problem. If you clean that up, you, know, you support your methylation, your histamine levels drop. Um, another big one is, you know, a lot of bodybuilders, right? Or people want to have defined muscles, you know, look toned. And if you look at your child and your child is, doesn't have real any muscle tone, their speech is delayed or they're not speaking very well, um, they're kind of weak, um, that is a sign that their creatine levels are lower than they should be. And creatine is a hugely important part uh, and product of methylation as well. So you can quickly tell if someone is methylating well, especially in children, um, as they're growing up, if their speech is solid and doing well, if they have muscle tone, if they're strong, then they've got good solid creatine, and that's because of good solid methylation. Thank you. And, and I want to jump into each genes, each of these seven in particular. Before we do that, since we're on the methylation topic and, and we're talking about uh, babies and having babies, one of the big ones that is, is really misunderstood by women out there, folic acid. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, folic acid is a, is a big problem. And I mean, remember that couple that I told you about with the, with the baby had yeah. a crania and, and, you know, no skull. And so they, she was taking folic acid. You know, she was taking uh, eight to four milligrams of folic, you know, 800 micrograms to four milligrams of folic mm -hmm. acid, because that is what the standard of medicine does. If you have a recurrent miscarriage, um, if you have a miscarriage, the, the, the next pregnancy is you're told to take four milligrams of folic acid. So if, if a little bit, i.e. 800 micrograms doesn't work, take more. And when you are facing a door and it's locked, pushing harder doesn't get you through it. You know, I mean, maybe if you come out with a big ram, you know, you can do something. But 
your genes don't like battering rams. They like the right product. It's like the key. So folic acid is the key that you can slide into the door lock, but it doesn't turn. It sits there, but it doesn't turn. You, you know, like, so you look for the right key. It's like, dang it, what's up with this? So then you used to take a different type of folate, like methyl folate, it slides in the, in the key lock, and it turns, and the door opens. So folic acid is like that n annoying key that tricks you every time where you mm -hmm. stick it in and it doesn't turn. And that's what it's doing to all your, your folate uh, receptors and your folate proteins in your body, and it's gumming them up. And even if your body, even if you have the right key, it won't fit because there's it's taken up right by another key so folic acid is one of those nutrients and I, I wrote an article called folic acid side effects at drbenlynch.com so you can google that to get more research and it's all i describe it also in the book but if you really want to get you know full on the meat you can go to that article on the site and watch the video too and see diagrams and the research um but folic acid is one of those synthetic nutrients that was invented because we destroyed our nutrients from our food that that's it we we stripped the bran and the nutrition out of our grains mm -hmm. because we wanted to sit on the shelves longer and we noticed early on that you know kids were being born with birth defects women weren't getting pregnant they were aborting or miscarrying and they're like oh god what's happening it's like oh we removed nutrition from the grains, so we we're going to synthesize a artificial nutrient that we pulled out and stick it back in <laughs> it's like oh that's genius so it does it does have some support. Folic mm -hmm. acid does help some people, but for the majority of the population, it doesn't. And so my thought is, okay, if folic acid helps just some people, not all, let's just stop using it all together and use the folates that the body naturally wants. And it's, it's like a no-brainer. So let's do that. Beautiful. Let's go from there and let's talk about um, MTHFR, the methylation master. Yes, yeah, so the methylation master, this is this is a really important gene, really important. It's the first gene I ever found uh, when I was researching, and mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know, learning more about bipolar disorder, and uh, this acronym, MTHFR, popped out, and it was a gene thing. I was like, what the heck is that? And it uh, looked a bit vulgar, to be honest. Uh, I typed it back into PubMed, <laughs> and uh, I saw about a, a lot of research saying that MTHFR is connected to cardiovascular disease, preeclampsia, recurrent miscarriage, stroke, uh, venous thromboses, uh, cancer, um, uh, bipolar, schizophrenia. I was like, oh my goodness. This was just on the first page of the mm -hmm. research article. And I, I was like, how do not, how does people not know about this? How come I'd never learned about this? Well, it's because the Human Genome Project wasn't done one until I was out of school. Um, but I got really excited. So what I learned about this gene is this job, you know, we, you just mentioned folic acid, right? Mm -hmm. So folic acid is folic acid and obviously, and we, we equate it to folate, but folate is, is an umbrella term. It's like, what kind of car do you drive? I drive a truck. Okay. What kind of truck do you drive? You know, you drive a dually or a flatbed or, you know, what kind of truck? So folic acid is one type of folate, and MTHFR makes methylfolate. Mm -hmm. It makes the body's main form of folate. It's the main type of folate your body wants. Over 80% in your blood should be methylfolate. Here's the kicker. Folic acid looks just like methylfolate, exactly the same, exactly, except there's no methyl group on it. It's not methylated. And to put that little methyl group, which is a simple carbon and three hydrogens, onto your synthetic folic acid requires about six or seven enzymatic steps, six or seven different genes, and they all have to be clean in order to do that. That's hard mm -hmm. because a lot of us have dirty genes. And so that folic acid cannot get that methyl group. So MTHFR's job is to put a methyl group onto the folate and become methylfolate, then that methylfolate goes to support methylation and it does it by taking your homocysteine and it, it methylates your homocysteine to turn it back into methylated homocysteine, which we know as methionine. And then it goes off from there to do 200 different things, which is why I call it the methylation master because it donates the methyl group from the methylfolate to the homocysteine to keep the methylation cycle going, which is doing 200 different things. So if your MTHFR gene is dirty, 
your methylation cycle is dirty, so is 200 other different things. It's a big deal. And if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, how do you start to get that in order? If you're a vegan or vegetarian, it's there's 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 two cycles uh, in the methylation cycle. So there's one that's occurring in every single cell of your body that uses the folate and the vitamin B12 and the homocysteine. So that happens everywhere, and that requires MTGFR. And you can get your methylfolate from your leafy green vegetables, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. So if you're eating green leafy vegetables and salads, great. Um, if you can also get it from liver, eh, I can't stand it. Um, my wife enjoys it. I don't. Um, but, uh, that's a huge source of folate. In fact, I think they isolated folate from liver, mm -hmm. uh, which is how they discovered it. Um, now if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you know, honestly, I, I know a lot of vegans and vegetarians. Well, I don't know a lot. That's not fair to say. I know a number and some of them are super healthy. And one of them was on my crew team, fit guy. He was a vegetarian done right. I was a vegetarian personally, and I did it all wrong. I screwed myself up and I was sick. Um, I was a carbitarian. I ate ah. just a bunch of carbs and, uh, I, I did not feel good at all. Um, but there's two parts of that methylation cycle and one, you need, uh, B12 and folate. Another one, you need choline and vegans do not get much choline. Mm -hmm. And so if your folate levels are low, your body is reliant upon choline. If your choline levels are low, it's reliant on folate. If both are low, you're in trouble. And I know a number of uh, vegans who and vegetarians whose choline levels are low, and you can get choline from eggs, you can get choline um, from meats, you can get it from beets and quinoa and a few other things too, but it's it's not as dense. It's mostly in, in meat products Thank and you. eggs. Yeah. So so the the takeaway from the MTH. Uh, MTHFR, and I have a hard time not thinking of that other word too, mm -hmm. um, when, when I go there, just because of how much it can affect us if it's dirty, is to start scrubbing this. We've got to get into our dark leafy greens, among other things. You got to get in your leafy greens and you got to start. I like, I like keeping it simple, Michael. I like people not really adding things to their life because they're already so busy and distracted. I want them avoiding things. I want them reducing things. So the, the, an easy way to start cleaning up your, your dirty empty Jafar is by avoiding folic acid, just reducing it. And there's a lot of benefits to that because where do you find folic acid, Michael? Well, a lot of your, your yeah, processed and bread groups. Yeah, exactly. So this whole thing about the ketogenic diet now, people are feeling so much better, yada, yada, yada. Well, there, there's issues with that too, as there is with any diet, but you know, Processed foods are loaded with folic acid. So if you're working hard on avoiding folic acid because it gums up your your folate machinery, and it does, I have tons of research to pr prove that, then uh, you are cleaning up your genes, all of them, and you're delivering actual useful folate to them so they can get their jobs done so you can feel better. And I did a survey of uh, over 5,000 people, and the number one thing that they said, which you know, I asked them, what's the biggest uh, most impactful tip that you've learned from me over the years. And this was, a, a, you know, it's a list that I've been growing for a number of, uh, of years. And they responded back saying, avoiding folic acid. It just, by that simple thing, lights turned on in my brain, I was feeling better and so on. So, and it's, you avoid the processed foods and the synthetic garbage uh, supplementation and energy bars and energy drinks at the same time. And you start feeling better by avoiding, not adding. Woohoo! So take us from there and talk to us about squirrel, um, C-O-M-T. <laughs> yeah, squirrel. Nice. Yeah, so if you got a, there's, C-O-M-T is a gene that works on a lot of your important neurotransmitters, your dopamine, which we all love our dopamine. That is what goes up when we hug someone. It's what goes up when we see someone smile. It goes up when we eat caloric dense foods. Yes, you heard that right. Caloric dense foods. Food scientists got you figured out. So if you go to food, fast food, and you sink into that garb, you know, garbage burger. That, that, that was a slip, but it, it's, it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah. um, so you you sink your teeth into that hamburger of, of fast food. You know your dopamine levels go up, and uh, so they got that figured out. And you know it's bad for you, but you're, you're confused on why you feel better. It's because your dopamine went up. So CMT's job is to process this dopamine and get it out of your system. And you're like, well, why do I want to get it out of my system? I want my dopamine. 
You don't want your dopamine all the time, and you want your dopamine levels balanced. Anything in excess is not good. Too much air will kill you. Too much water will kill you. Um, you know, I, I never thought of too many hugs will kill you. Um, oh, I'll take them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hugs would be good, but you do need to expand your chest when you're breathing, so maybe that would be a problem. Um, so that aside, CMT also works on your estrogen mm -hmm. also, but let's stick with dopamine. And so CMT has different speeds and it can go fast yep. and it can clear that dopamine out really quickly. And that is why Michael said squirrel, because you get attracted just like raccoons to shiny objects or moving flighting things because you have lower dopamine and you have difficulty focusing when this happens. So if you're multitasking right now while you're listening to this, Maybe your CMT is too fast. Hello, hello, hope, hope you're, you're tuning back in <laughs> here because you need more protein. Why do you need more protein? Because protein build, provides the building blocks to create your dopamine because protein provides tyrosine, which then feeds into creating dopamine. And that is one way to slow your fast CMT gene. So that is one aspect of it. Another one, there's benefits though to a fast CMT. So an individual who has a lower levels of dopamine, mm -hmm. They are the type of person that works very well in stressful situations. Think the brain surgeon, the cardiovascular doc, the EMT, the, um, the person who's – you always wonder how those kids in, Olymp in the Olympics can fly 30 feet in the air and do 20 different backflips and land it, right? These people, I think, have fast CMTs because in stressful situations, their dopamine levels rise mm -hmm. and they can – focus really well without being scared. Now, if I was going to do those backflips, my dopamine levels are already high. Now my dopamine levels are so high, I become fearful and scared and anxious and irritable. And I'm not going to go jumping off that thing, but they can. So there's benefits to them. And I described them very clearly in the book. And uh, it, it's fun when you're doing the personality quiz and you're like, oh, that explains so much. I, I worked in the in the ADHD field for years. In fact, my first book was uh, to help college students and adults, young adults with ADHD, and talking about how we can do it without medication. And so I was fascinated to read about your son, Tasman, and tyrosine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's a number of different types of ADHD, and Dr. Daniel Amen uh, mm -hmm. dives into the different varieties of them. Um, you know, there's low dopamine types, there's high dopamine types, you know, so it's it's a, it's a balance. But um, so for my son, Tasman, he has a faster CMT gene. So his gene moves through the dopamine quickly. And it's interesting, you know, he, he loves giving hugs, even as a teenager. He loves uh, video games and he loves uh, sport and he's really good at them. And he loves taking risks. Uh, he will dive down a chute in, in skiing that's super narrow and steep with all sorts of stuff in front of him. And he just goes straight down and figures it all, navigates it. Meanwhile, my middle son and I look at each other and like, damn, <laughs> what are we going to do? And uh, Tasman, you know, his dopamine levels were flying right there and he's doing well. But Matthew and I become fearful because our dopamine levels are naturally higher because we have a slower CMT than Tasman. So Tasman, you know, he, he came to me one day from school and he goes, Dad, I'm having difficulty focusing in class. And I said, what's up? And he goes, I don't know. I'm just sitting there and I, I just, it just doesn't work. I'm just like messing around and moving my feet and – is my teachers keep telling me to stop moving my feet, but it helps me focus. So, I was, you know, it's kind of new to me, this whole ADD thing and my own kid, you know, he's like, I expect my kids to be good students and thankfully they are. Um, but I, I, I was concerned for him. So I, I thought about this for a moment and I, I, you know, for actually a long time and I gave him tyrosine, but I was reluctant to give him tyrosine because I knew tyrosine for me would make me anxious and irritable. Mm -hmm. And so I gave him tyrosine and he goes, wow, he calmed right down, he stopped moving, and his concentration was great, and he goes, Dad, I'm able to concentrate in school, it's great. And I was like, okay, he's my son, we are slightly different genetics, because I ran his genetics, I looked at them, and uh, he also didn't like eating protein, he's a carb guy, and uh, also because of his dopamine, right, he, he, he likes those caloric fast food foods, um, and uh, so he didn't eat much protein, so I knew his tyrosine was lower anyway from that. So I said, oh, I felt pretty safe giving the tyrosine. So he did it, and he was doing it every day, 500 milligrams, and he was probably 12 or 11 at the time. So 500 milligrams for him was great. And then about a year later, he was just an a-hole. I mean, he was so 
argumentative and just a punk. And it was going on for like two weeks. And finally, I, we were screaming at each other more. And I, I just stopped one day. I just stopped. And I said, dude, what is up with you? You girlfriend dump you? Are you somebody teasing you at school? And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, some change. You're not right. And then it hit me. I was like, are you, how many tire scenes are you taking? He goes, I don't know, two, three, four at a time? Yeah. I was like, well, no, you take one, one. Oh, I thought more would be better. It's like, no. So he slowed his COMT down. Mm -hmm. He took so much tire scene. Now he had a slow COMT. Now he's acting like a slow COMT person who's anxious and irritable and a punk. And so I, I said, just stop taking it for a while. And he got his old self again. So now he's eating protein. And he's not taking tyrosine as much anymore because he's eating enough protein because he's doing what? He's a teenage boy. He wants to gain muscle. So he's finally eating protein and uh, he doesn't have to supplement tyrosine much anymore. And his focus is good. Woohoo! Is there something you'd have us take out of our diet for COMT? Taking out of your diet? Well, that's or a eliminating. Good point. Yeah, I would say not really eliminating, but modulating, mm -hmm. um, being aware of how your moods are and what you're eating at the same time. Um, I would say uh, xeno, you know, harmful estrogens are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So COMT works with estrogens too. So you know, if you're eating out of plastic, uh, get rid of that. You're drinking out of plastic water bottles, get rid of that. Um, drink out of glass or, or silicone or, or stainless steel. Um, so, and definitely don't cook in plastic or heat your foods in plastic because that will definitely cause issues. Um, and in terms of eliminating, I would just say reduce protein in the evening. If you have a faster, if you have a slower COMT, you reduce the amount of protein you're eating at night. And during the day, make sure you're eating protein in the morning and lunch for both of these types, fast or slow. Did I mention in the books a certain food to eliminate, Michael? I don't remember. Not that I can recall. That's, uh, yeah. um, but it's, it's one since you had said earlier, I made a mental book note. It's easier to remove than to add. So oh, I figured gotcha. I would add that question in a few times over to see yes. what we come up with. Yeah, you're right. So you, you remove the protein. And so, you know, a lot of books have cooked, you know, recipes in there, right? And, and my, my publisher said, you know, I want you to write a re recipes and a menu plan. It's like, well, that's not possible. I can't give a menu plan. They said, well, you need to figure out how to do it. I said, well, it's not possible because people are uniquely different. Thank and you. they need to modulate their meals according to how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. They're like, what are you talking about? I said, this is the whole core of, of dirty genes. And so if you are stressed and anxious and you had, and you found out you're a slower COMT type, then you need basically little to no protein for dinner. So you're not making more histamine or more dopamine, more norepi. And, um, and so people make that one simple change, which again, it's avoiding, right? So you're avoiding, it's not really avoiding protein because it's not bad for you. It's just at that time, you don't need more of it. So that I would say, yeah, it's a good point, Michael. So yeah, I would say that. Thank you. So now let's talk about a gene. I want to, I, 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 we always do me search. I'm sure you do me search. I do me search. So, mm -hmm. so my wife has had health challenges in the past. And first off, we want to have a baby in the future, but we ran into a snag again, which is extreme mold sensitivity and chemical sensitivity. Yes. Yes, glutathione, big time. Um, mold is pervasive, and it is one of those hidden problems that needs to be more recognized. So I'm glad you brought that up. And no matter where you live, unless you're really, really, really high up in the mountains in Colorado or elsewhere. Which we're uh, moving to in April. Okay, see? And, and why? To get rid of the mold, right? Bingo. Yeah, because mold spores can't grow at this elevation. And uh, so that that is one way to go about it. And that's what some people have to do. And again, that goes back to sometimes the recommendation I have for people for their health challenges is to move. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, while we're on that topic, I give a, a recommendation in the book called Scorecard. Scorecard.org is where you type in your zip code to see the top polluters in your area along with the top chemicals. And that's an eye opener. Um, it's a huge eye opener and uh, scary but you can do something about it called move. <laughs> I have um, score, I'm going to repeat that, scorecard.org. Scorecard and there's another fascinating one that you have in there for, and I, I, I'm forgetting, it might be ewg.org, yes. which is the dirty dozen. Yes, correct. The dirty dozen and the clean dozen. Yeah. So, you know, because 
you know, one, one, I, I read reviews all the time on Amazon. I, I learn a lot from, from people, uh, on, by reading reviews. And one of the common reviews I would read from folks reading health books is all oh, that's really great, but it's so expensive to be healthy. And I really wanted to neutralize that. I really wanted to get rid of that mindset. I really wanted to make it easy for people to get healthier without having to spend a bunch of money. So environmental working group, ewg.org allows you to avoid the dirty dozen and buy the clean dozen, which means that, you know, everybody talks about you have to buy organic. Well, you don't have to buy the clean dozen organic. You can just get them conventional, right? You don't need to spend that extra money. So that's a way to save money is you avoid the chemicals, but you, yet you can buy the cleaner dozen and just eat those, not, you know, they're non organic. So that's one way to go about it. Now, in terms of mold, uh, it's everywhere. I've, I've had issues uh, a number of times here in Seattle, rainy, dank, cloudy weather, um, north facing walls and so on. Um, you know, I've had mold in my home, uh, a couple of my homes and dealt with it. Um, so it's, it's a huge issue. And so it dirties up a number of genes, but a big one that it messes up is your glutathione genes and mold actually prevents your glutathione from being produced in the first place which is hugely important. And I found this research article um, and I was super excited to read it. And the researcher actually came to one of my conferences. She goes, oh, I wrote that. I was like, wow, thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, but glutathione is your body's number one antioxidant. It's, it's hugely important. We are oxygen burning animals. And uh, you know, we, we burn oxygen as fuel. And oxygen, we don't run our cars with it because it's so explosive, but our body does. And so we have a bunch of glutathione inside our oxygen burning cells in order to help neutralize those fires that we're generating all the time. So if mold is not allowing your body to make glutathione, then you're, you're having micro fires all over your body, which makes you more uh, susceptible to various different things. Plus you're accumulating all these chemicals and compounds mm -hmm. that you would otherwise be eliminating. So you become super sensitive. And um, by taking liposomal glutathione, it helps. But again, goes back to number one, avoid. And you've got to find the mold. You've got to find the chemicals you're reacting to and just get them out of your life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got time for maybe one or two more genes. Everybody's just going to need to go out and get the book. I can't recommend it enough. And, and I think it changes everything when you get this. I love, I love the new perspective I'm gaining on... There's a lot of talk about epigenetics, but this is a really, this goes beyond the just meditate and sleep, although those are critical, and particularly that sleep element is huge. But, but maybe give us one more gene that's really important that we look into for ourselves. Well, I would say one, it's, it's just a really big, and they're all big. I mean, that's why they're the super seven, and people have asked me before in, in other interviews why I picked these seven, and you can tune into those other interviews um, to learn about that. But DAO, hugely important. This is the one I was going to pick. DAO has to do with your histamine outside of your cell. Okay, so histamine containing uh, foods and drinks. If you're if you have these weird symptoms and you never know why, you go to doctor after doctor and you, you just you just get headaches and runny noses and con congestion and irritable and can't sleep and you have eczema and psoriasis and uh, you've got digestive issues and irritable bowel and um, you just don't know you can't trace anything. It could be a dirty DAO, and this is very common. I get a dirty DAO. We all get dirty DAO at times, and why is that? Because DAO is a, is a gene that lives in many, many places, but it really lives in your small intestine and uh, your large intestine, and its job is to get rid of histamine in there mm -hmm. and to, to keep it at normal levels. And if, it, if it's dirty, you got histamine in high amounts in your in your gut which then gets into your bloodstream and now it acts all throughout your system which gives you asthma gives you exercise induced asthma it gives you red face when you're exercising which doesn't go away it gives you skin disorders and irritability like i just talked about so if you clean up your dirty dao your asthma goes away your psoriasis and your your eczema goes away your irritability irritability and your insomnia goes away if you take your fingernails and you scratch your skin you got red lines, that's a dirty DAO and a dirty MTHFR, both. So you clean those up, your histamine levels drop, you're a new person. It's that simple. You don't need to take all these antihistamines. And so dirty DAO is very, very sensitive 
and it there's bacteria which increase histamines as well in your gut. There's also probiotics. So if if your friends or your family or your doctor say, "Oh, probiotics are awesome. Take them." Well, they are awesome, but some people need more histamine, others need less. And if you're taking a probiotic which is actually increasing histamine, like Lactobacillus bulgaricus or Lactobacillus acidophilus or Lactobacillus fermentum, these increase histamine and you probably will feel worse. And you're like, oh, probiotics are horrible. What are, uh, what are some high histamine foods? High histamine foods are leftovers. Mm -hmm. So if you eat leftovers, your, body, your food is fermenting. It's decaying and it's producing histamine. The bacteria are having a heyday. If you buy fish that was not immediately... Uh, cleaned and processed and then eaten, uh, these fish are producing huge amounts of histamine and you're eating that and you're going to feel worse from eating fish. Um, so fish, if you have dirty DAO, you, have, you can eat very, very fresh fish and rinse the meat before you eat it and you're going to be okay. But if you eat uh, old fish or frozen fish, uh, it could be worse for you. Um, it's all citrus family. Anything citrus will be bad for you. Um, another one would be uh, a lot of berries. A lot of berries can be higher histamine. I don't do well with many berries. You know, raspberries I do okay with sometimes, but I do really well with blueberries. Um, strawberries are higher histamine too. Strawberries, you see, there was common recommendations when I was at school at Bastyr. Avoid dairy, um, especially yogurt. Mm -hmm. That's, yogurts are high histamine and kefirs. Avoid yogurts and kefirs and strawberries, and you'll see that your kid's eczema goes away. And orange juice. I mean, what do kids eat? They eat orange juice, strawberries, and yogurts. And they're riddled with eczema. And oftentimes they would come back in the clinic and their stress is, or eczema would go away. And I'm thinking, wow, why is that? And it's a dirty DAO. Estrogen levels in women. Oh, yes. Yes, thanks. Estrogen levels in women uh, is tied to many, many genes in the book. Um, it's tied to a dirty DAO mm -hmm. uh, also because estrogen can stimulate histamine release as well because um, histamine is naturally stored inside of cells and when there's a signal to release the histamine that's when you get the histamine symptoms but naturally your body keeps the histamine inside the cell ready to release at any moment's notice because it's beneficial but in high amounts it's not um, so estrogen will stimulate the release and and cause issues a slower cmt will increase estrogen in women a estrogen is also needed to stimulate and support a NOS3 for your cardiovascular system. So as women age, their estrogen levels decline. As they decline, their ability to produce nitric oxide goes down and they get cardiovascular disease. And we see that often in women postmenopause. We also see a lot of stomach, uh, we see a lot of pain in, uh, going up um, in other conditions like fibromyalgia and cell membrane production. Uh, responds to estrogen so that if your estrogen levels are dropping there's a gene in the book called PEMT whose job is to make cell membranes um, its job is actually not to make cell membranes to make the ingredients for cell membranes mm -hmm. uh, phosphatidylcholine and that leads also to uh, gallbladder issues which are very pervasive in women uh, we had the three S which are pretty vulgar but it's how we learned in, in med school female fat fertile and 40 um, so these all have to do with bile flow. And so if you're female, uh, fertile, fat, 40, then your risk for gall gallbladder issues and bile problems are really, really high. Is there a way to save the gallbladder? Yes. Big time. Yeah. So, uh, the PEMT chapter is very, very important to read uh, along with the dirty empty Jafar chapter because empty Jafar supports methylation and methylation supports PEMT. So a lot of people wonder, it's like, well, Ben, how can, how can you write this book? And some of the quizzes questions overlap. It's like, well, the quiz questions overlap because the body overlaps. The body, you know, has cohesive functions. Blood flows everywhere. And, uh, you know, as Dr. Sachin Patel says, and you, you, you've got to understand that these genes don't work on an individual basis. They, you know, one works, it's like an assembly line, right? You, it's, they, one does a job and passes the end product onto another gene. So MGFR passes on methylfolate, which supports then the PEMT so it can do its job and make phosphatidylcholine. And so you can save your gallbladder. Um, yes, uh, sometimes you can have a very inflamed infection mm -hmm. in your gallbladder and maybe it's an emergency situation and you need to get it removed. But I'll tell you, 
that I personally believe that gallbladder removal, I'm just I'm going to shoot from the hip, single digits, single digits. I Thank mean, like you. one, two, three percent at the time does it actually need to be removed? Um, you know, altering your diet, supporting your genes, cleaning your genes, and uh, to give you an idea. I have significant dirty genes which predispose me to fatty liver and gallbladder issues. I've had a number of gallbladder issues already, even at a young age, but visceral manipulation is fantastic, fantastic, and it's very easy, it's very light, you don't even feel like anything's happening, mm -hmm. but uh, I really irritated my gallbladder and um, I ruined my digestion because I, I had a sickness and I just blew up my microbiome by taking a lot of antimicrobials trying to get myself healthy again. And I created this pretty intense constipation and I couldn't fix it. I was in introducing probiotics and all these things. I couldn't fix it. And uh, I could feel my, my underneath my right rib cage was a bit heavy. Mm -hmm. And I had right shoulder pain that was just awful. And so I called my friend, Dr. Aaron Choi. I said, Aaron, can you please work on my liver? And he worked on my liver. And next day I had an amazing bowel movement. My shoulder pain was gone and uh, I was fixed. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was amazing. So look into that. So first off, since we don't have time to get through all of the genes, and even if we did, everybody needs to go out and get this book. Where do people go to find this book and to find out more? Anywhere where books are sold. And uh, keeping it very easy, but you can get it in bookstores. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, um, IndieBound, uh, your local website? library. Yeah, dirtygenes.com. Uh, so you can go to dirtygenes.com, and there is really cool because when you when you purchase your book, you can enter in your receipt, your name and email, and you get a bunch of free bonuses as well. There's a bonus chapter, which is really, really good. I was pushing to get it included in the book, but the publisher says, no, it's already long, and, and she was right. It was too long. It's not too long, but it would have made it way too long. So grab your bonus chapter, and um, you can get your bonus chapter at drbenlynch.com, and it's the ABCs of Clean Genes. It's a really good chapter. Fantastic. Once Jessica get, has her health uh, topped up, or even during this process, thinking about pregnancy coming along, any thoughts? Oh, man. I Yeah, a lot of thoughts on pregnancy. Um, definitely reading the book will help. There's a lot of great things in the book for pregnancy. Um, and I would say that choline is the, is a huge one. Everybody talks about folate. So avoid folic acid. Number one, uh, number two is find a prenatal that contains a combination of folinic acid and methylfolate folinic acid. We didn't talk about, we do talk about it briefly in the book. Um, but, uh, I have videos, uh, folic acid and pregnancy that are freely available on YouTube, which you can watch. Um, choline is, is 90% of women are deficient in choline. And that is causing huge problems, including dementia as you age. Um, so I would be looking at 800 milligrams of, of choline a day, um, which is not easy to get because I think about 200 milligrams are in one egg. Um, so you got to really load up on choline during pregnancy and do not get the flu shot. Do not get vaccinated during the pregnancy. Uh, step away from that to get more credible uh, information. Look at Dr. Dr. Paul Thomas's book, The Vaccine Friendly Plan. Mm -hmm. Please do not get vaccinated uh, the flu shot during pregnancy. It is not safe and it can cause a lot of problems and avoid ibuprofen and Tylenol as well. And nitrous oxide is also bad during pregnancy. Um, so avoid that as well. And I, I give things here too. But yeah, there's a bunch of things. That's going to be hopefully my next book that I write is, is preconception. Thank you. Any last words you give to parents for their kids? Parents for their kids. Yeah. So as a parent myself with three boys, um, you know, being firm and strict, it's okay to parent. There's actually a really good book called Permission to Parent. Stop being a friend and be a parent. You know, your kids rely on you to to give them structure. And, you know, they, they say they don't like it, but they love it. So give your kids structure and be firm and follow through. And uh, there's a great course also called Love, Love and Logic. So you can go to loveandlogic.com and take a free seminar by them. It's exceptional. So your, your children have to learn through pain. And they learn through love. And sometimes that painful situation, all you can say, guy, I'm really sorry. You know, I wish I could help you out here. I'd love you to be able to, but you can't. And so they're learning for that consequence. And it's, it's hard. It's really hard to do that. Um, but I would say also, um, you know, it's okay to have dirty genes. Uh, you're going to be doing things in their, your life and they're going to be doing things in their life that cause dirty genes. So as long as you're living by that 80, simple 80-20 principle where 20% of your actions are dirty or 20% of their actions are dirty, 
then, you know, let them eat certain foods. Don't, you know, my kids drink soda, they eat junk food. You know, they, you know, I, I'm not a tyrant when it comes to that because I grew up in a home which was very strict around food and I rebelled when I got out of school, out of that home and I would sit down and eat a half a gallon of ice cream and uh, like, ha, I'm eating it now and uh, make myself sick. Now I want to do that under my own roof so I can teach my kids and they get acne. I just tell them, oh, look, and I, I play it hard. I say, You're eating that fast food. Look what it's doing to you. Mm-hmm. So I teach them the consequences here in the home and then uh, support them through it. Thanks so much. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? I know many of you are thinking here it sounds too easy and you've tried everything. Well, first of all, you haven't tried everything because you're still sick. Keep the hope alive. You can get better. I've, I've worked with many, many customers, many clients, many patients, many docs, even family members who have been very, very stuck and they get better. So believe in that because the belief causes actions and actions cause change. And Gandhi's got a great quote that goes along with that. But uh, just keep the hope alive and keep seeking and find doctors that resonate with you because you are in control, not your doctor. Your doctor is a guide. You are the boss. Okay. It's your life, not theirs. And if you are not happy with your doctor, you know, move on. You have choices in life and every choice that you make is going to clean your jeans or it's going to dirty them. And every choice that you make, know that. And so don't give up on yourself. You know, I've got people that have been way, way overweight and they know that they're making the wrong choices. Just make the next choice the right choice. And uh, you know what that is. And it is easy. So it's just discipline. And uh, we all have it. And uh, just get it done. Woohoo! Thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been fantastic. And uh, if people dive into your book, and I think even take, like you say, the 80-20, and scratch and take little bits here and there, I think that alone could make a big difference. Huge. Huge difference. Yeah. just And I, I mentioned it through the book, too. There's a whole section in the book called Soak and Scrub. And it, the book was supposed to be a two-week program to clean up your dirty jeans. And I was like, no, nah, that's not possible. It's, this is a lifestyle. This is a guide. This is a book for the rest of people's lives. And so as you go through the Soak and Scrub, don't overwhelm yourself. Don't overwhelm yourself anywhere. Just read a section. You'll learn something. Apply it. Put it down and apply it. Get it pattern. Make it a habit. Pick it up again. Read it. Apply that. Make it a habit. Reapply it. Go back. So don't feel that you can read the book through entirely and not do anything. That's great. And then read it, start reading it again and start making one change at a time until it becomes a habit. And don't force yourself. You know, this is a lifetime of learning from me put in a 350 50 pages. So apply at your own speed. Don't overwhelm yourself. One change at a time. And uh, the ABCs of Clean Jeans, that bonus chapter is an easy way to do that. But start with avoidance. And A is avoid, B is breathe, and C is to chew. So if you can avoid things that are causing stress in your life, if you improve your breathing through your nose and being conscious of how you're breathing and chewing your food, those three simple things will improve you a lot. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Ben. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get dirty jeans, and begin scrubbing your jeans today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, Ben. Awesome. Great questions. That was a lot of fun. That was one of the best podcasts I think I've done. Yeah. He shoots, he scores. <laughs> yeah, he definitely scored. Well done. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>